Epiphany really happened last Monday, the 12th day of Christmas on the 6th. And this is one of those years when it fell on a Monday, and so we are celebrating Epiphany Sunday nearly a week after it happened. But this is the story of those travelers from the East arriving to bring their gifts to the newborn king. It comes from Matthew, the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the East came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many of you have an elf on a shelf somewhere in your house? Long before there were elves on shelves, there were the three wise men, or the three kings, or the three travelers. There were always three. We have three up here today, represented by three crowns, and three figures from someone's crash. Used to be that when you set up your crash, you didn't put baby Jesus in until when? Christmas Day, Christmas morning, you would put the baby in the manger. And the wise men, believe it or not, did not get there that night. They traveled a long distance. How many of you have ever taken a trip to Disney World? I know we have some, I knew you were going to raise your hand because you just got back from Disney World. Do you arrive the day you think of getting there? Probably not, unless you're going to go to an airport and buy a direct flight to Orlando. It takes some preparation. And so what people would do, because their nativity set came with the characters, they would start out in a different part of the house. And every day they would move closer and closer and closer, not getting there on Christmas, even though every church pageant you ever has has little people in bathrobes and Burger King crowns, <laughs> getting there that night. But Jesus was nearly two years old by the time they got there. And we know that King Herod, who should have known when he was going to be there, we know what he did, don't we, when he found out the time the star had appeared. He ordered the slaughter of every baby boy two years and younger in the city. It's an interesting story that we're celebrating today. I wish we could get back to that tradition of moving the wise men through the house and looking at who they really are and what they really brought and looking at how they traveled. It was actually hearing what the kids were going to sing this morning that made me think about what I wanted to say this morning about Epiphany. It's about following the star. But it's not about following a star in the sky, really. is it? It's about following Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, a light that no darkness can overcome. It's about absorbing his light and letting it shine in and through us. It's about letting other people know, because that's what an epiphany is. You know what the word epiphany means, right? It's an aha moment. It's, I could have had a V8 moment. It's when finally the truth becomes clear to you. It's a revelation. As Paul said in the letter, it's an uncovering of the mystery of God. And that's what these foreign visitors do. It's amazing, isn't it? These foreigners, these studiers of the stars, these magi, who were wise in terms of being learned in what they saw in the sky and how to interpret it. But really, they're foreigners. They're Gentiles. They're people with other faith traditions. But they recognize in that light 
that something world-changing has occurred, that whoever was born under that star had to be one of the greatest rulers of all time. They got it, but his own people did not. Herod, who was the king of the Jews, don't you think he should have known when and where the Messiah was to be born? He had to go and ask, and he was so afraid that he had to order the slaughter of these children. It's got a lot of tragedy in the story for a story about light and light coming into darkness. But it is a story that was prophesied. We read the prophecy that kings would come to the light of the world. They would bring the fabulous wealth of the nations. They would bring frankincense and myrrh and gold. Now, these are not gifts befitting a baby. They're gifts befitting a king. And each gift tells a story about who this baby is, gold. Gold is the gift that you give a king. Gold is the gift, and that's why we call them kings, because they could afford such extravagant gifts. But they had to go to great lengths to collect these wealthy treasures to bring to this new king. And gold is a gift that only a king could afford and only a king would receive. Then frankincense. Why frankincense, do you think? Frankincense was the very incense used in the temple to bring glory to God. So by giving the gift of frankincense, they're telling us that this isn't just a king, this is a deity, this is someone to be worshiped. And myrrh, the saddest of all. Myrrh was the spice used to anoint a body to prepare it for burial. We're gonna sing the song that everyone associates with Epiphany. You've been waiting to sing it, I'm sure. We three kings, glorious now behold him arise, king with gold, God with frankincense and sacrifice myrrh. Jesus Christ, born as a human, yet fully divine. And when they arrive, King Herod lies and says, I want to worship him too. But he is so frightened by this little toddler born to poor people that he is going to go to extremes to make sure that this threat to his reign ends once and for all. We know the rest of the story, don't we? Joseph is warned by that angel again in a dream to take the child and his mother, and they flee as refugees to Egypt to protect him from the king. Refugee is not a dirty word. Refugee is not a political term. It is exactly what happened to our Lord and Savior at the time of his birth. And I often think when I read about refugees in the news, about what it must be like to have to pick up with the clothes on your back and leave to save your life or the life of your children. But that's how God comes to us. God comes to us in the frailty of a human infant who grows, whose life is threatened along the way, but who continues to love and to serve and to proclaim who God is. I said I love the song the kids sang this morning, and they were talking about what happens when the star is obscured. How many of you know what a sextant is? Not a sextant, a church sextant. What's a sextant? It's for celestial navigation. It's a device that they use to study the stars to be able to tell where the star was in relation to the horizon so that sailors at sea or others could get their bearings. And it's wonderful, isn't it, to look up at a sky full of stars? Have you ever been out to the far west where there are no lights, where there's no light pollution at night? It's like a different sky because you can see so many stars. And one thing that I'm missing, having moved here from West Virginia, is seeing stars at night. I see reflection of lights from Reisterstown Road at night. <laughs> but how do you find your way? when the light is not there, when the clouds cover the light. I think the clouds that cover the light for us sometimes are not literal clouds, but there are things that obscure our ability to see the light of God in Jesus Christ. What are some of those things? For Herod, it was fear of losing his kingdom and his power and his palace because he was a, one who colluded with the Roman Empire against the will of his people and his God. So sometimes jealousy and power hunger can obscure the view. What are other things that obscure our view of the light of Jesus Christ today in the world? It's not a rhetorical question you get to answer. Toby. Turned the, wrong way. 
Sometimes we're just turned the wrong way. I loved how Bill had the star shining up here and the kids were pointing over here. <laughs> and they knew it was there because we practiced that. But sometimes don't you just turn the wrong way? Sometimes accidentally, sometimes on purpose, because we can be stubborn, cussed people, can we not? What are other things that obscure our ability to see the bright light of Jesus Christ in the world? Money? It's, oh, amen, money. That was part of Herod's problem. He was afraid of losing his palace. Fear. fear. Absolutely fear. And right now in the United Methodist Church, it's all over the news again. Please do not believe that anything has been decided until general conference meets in the spring. But people are talking like we're already dividing the spoils of the United Methodist Church between factions and we're all going to vote and we're all going to be under the gun. Something is going to change. We know that. But we don't know yet what it's going to be. But we cannot let that kind of fear stop us from seeing the light of Christ and reflecting that light in the world. So fear can certainly obscure our view of Christ in the world. What else can obscure our view? Do you ever just get so busy sometimes that you can't see straight? Do you ever get so overwhelmed and so tired that you just feel alone in the world? Grief, separation, divorce, loss, financial instability, all these things can prevent us from seeing the light. So those of you who knew what a sextant was, how do they navigate when you can't see the stars? A compass, they could do it that way, or sometimes they would just, when they could see the star, they would set the course and they would keep on the course. Or do what the kids said this morning. If you can't see the light, what do you do? You take a step of faith. Now, some of them almost stepped right off the stairs up here. But you take a step of faith. Over the Sundays following Epiphany, we're going to read stories of call. We're going to read stories of those who chose to let the light shine in and through them. We have that choice to make, don't we? We can take a step of faith. We can say, I don't know where the United Methodist Church is going to be in four months, but I know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in Epworth Church serving Jesus Christ. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be feeding people who are hungry. I'm going to be building ramps for people who can't get into their home. I'm going to be here serving. I'm going to be teaching the next generation the stories of our Savior and our Lord so that they know who it is that we worship and why it is that we're here, why we're together. We're going to keep serving. We're going to keep proclaiming. We're going to keep living the truth of God and Jesus Christ to the best of our ability. That's what it is to take a step in faith. There have been times in my life, I can tell you, when seeing the light was very difficult. The death of my husband made it sometimes seem like such a dark night I didn't know which way to turn. That's when I remembered the promises of God my Savior, and that's when I was able to continue to keep walking no matter what. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be the light. Jesus said you're the light of the world, but we are not the light that, over, that no darkness can overcome. That is who he is. But we are called to reflect the light. So I want you all to go into the world today thinking of yourself as a mirror. I want you to mirror the light of Christ and what you do and what you say and who you are, regardless of fear, regardless of grief, regardless of pain, because the sun is there even when we cannot see it. Have you learned that through the years that even when the clouds are out there, the sun is still shining behind the clouds? And what is it about a rainbow that we all love? They take us by surprise, don't they? That sign of the covenant of God with Noah that we still like to see. How many of you go out and look for rainbows if it's raining and a little sunny at the same time? You look because you know it's got to be there somewhere. Just remember, you always see a rainbow most clearly against the darkest part of the sky. Now, I don't want us to be people who only pray or worship when things are bad because sometimes we can tend to do that. But when the sun is obscured by the clouds, or when darkness threatens to overcome you, go to the source of the light. Find Jesus Christ, and if you can't find him on your own, call someone sitting around you here and say, I need you to help me because my vision is dim. I need you to help remind me and lead me and walk beside me. Because we are called to lead others into the truth of Jesus Christ. 
So if you can't see the star at night or you don't feel the sun shining during the day, trust in the promise and take the step of faith and Christ will lead you where Christ will have you go. The light is always with us. Learn to trust the light. Learn to trust the light and be like a wise guy and follow wherever the star leads you. Amen? Amen. Let's